In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Or thank you for the chance to enter once again into the sacred space and time, which is a Bible study done in your name. We ask you, Father, to speak to us your words of compassion and truth and correction and guidance through the words of the gospel. And I ask you, Lord, to just make it real to us and help us to understand at least a little bit of the sublime mystery that you have revealed to mankind through Jesus Christ and through the Gospels. We ask this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So last week we got right up to the beginning of chapter 4. And I'm not going to go back too much. The last story in chapter 3, he's called his 12 apostles. And then he's in Capernaum, still in Galilee, which as you know is where he uh, first part of his ministry was centered. And then we ended with this story about his kinsmen coming to Capernaum to try to get him or lay claim to him. It's a, it a very interesting uh, approach to this idea of the family of Jesus that um, mainly comes from St. Jerome. One of the, he's a great Bible scholar of the uh, the fourth century, and, and, and Jerome wrote a lot of commentaries that we still have. Father Pixner you, uh, made available a lot of those, made those available to himself and a lot of those. And, uh, but not only does he and, he, and he lived in Israel for a long time, so he was very familiar with a lot of these places where the gospel events took place. And also was early enough, this is before the Byzantines be, built the big basilicas, before the the Muslims came in and destroyed them and they've been rebuilt and everything. He was really seeing them very close to the time of the actual event. And also could speak to the people who lived there, the Christians, the Jewish Christians that had come back from Pella, where they went to escape the destruction of, uh, of Jerusalem and all the rest of Israel by the Roman army in 70 AD. They came back and were living in these areas and were very careful to point out and protect the stories and the places. So he was able to talk to them. He was fluent in Latin and Greek and Hebrew as well. So his commentaries are powerful and insightful in a way that even the best scholar of many years later didn't have. But he not only read and studied the, the gospel stories, the scriptures that we have them, but he also had access to a lot of extra canonical works, that is, works that are are not in the Bible that were available and, and popular to some degree at his time. Now, we don't believe that they are inspired. The Holy Spirit spoke to the church, we believe, so that they made it into the canon of Scripture. But that doesn't mean they're totally useless. So he read and, and interpreted and commented on uh, works like the Proto-Evangelium of James. And also one, I think it was called the Gospel of Hebrews, and a lot of others. But I think of those right now when I think about the story of the kinsmen of Jesus because from those he came to deduce that the family of Jesus, these brothers of Jesus that we talk about, were a combination perhaps of stepbrothers, remember sons of Joseph from a previous marriage, or first cousins, the sons of Joseph's brother Cleopas, or maybe a combination of the two. And what he writes is that initially they were not followers of Jesus. Jesus assembled his own apostles and the family, as he said in the, in the scriptures we finished with last week, that were his because of the Holy Spirit and baptism. But the story goes in these extra canonicals that as time went by, his natural family, his kinsmen, also came by and large to believe in him. And there, are, there is evidence of that in our own the scriptures that we do have, for, for instance, the wife of Clopas, or Cleopas, at the foot of the cross. Her name was also Mary. That's the one who's identified as Mary's sister, Mary. All right? But he said that um, one of the reasons hanging on the cross, Jesus said to Mary and John, Mary representing his family, John representing his apostles, that I, I give you to each other. I want these two groups of believers now to be united. I don't want you to be in separate camps anymore. 
You understand? That's why at Pentecost it says the apostles plus Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers were gathered in the upper room. Okay? It could also be why in the book of Acts we know that they appointed a bishop of Jerusalem, the early community did. But it wasn't Peter. They decided Peter needed to be the bishop of what? Rome, Rome the universal church. But they discerned that the bishop in Jerusalem needed to be a kinsman of Jesus from his own family. So we know they appointed James. And according to Josephus and others, that would be the James who was the eldest brother in this group. Okay, And likewise... When he was martyred later on, they replaced him with the last remaining brother of Jesus, who was Simon. So he lists them out, J James being the oldest, Simon being the youngest, and Jesus probably would be even younger than Simon. So they made him the, the next bishop of Jerusalem. He's the one that historians tell us, some Christian historians and also some secular historians, um, Pliny and Eusebius and others, uh, Africanus, I think was his name, uh, who tell us that when the Jewish armies arrived in 67, 68 AD and started their reconquest of Israel in punishment for the rebellion, you know, this is the one that ended in 70 AD with a year-long siege of Jerusalem and its final utter destruction, including the temple being destroyed where not stone, one stone was left on another, as Jesus predicted. But when that invasion began, it was Simon, discerning the prophecy of Jesus, who led the Christian Jews out of Israel. They left. And they went to Jordan to Pella, a mountainous town that they had prepared in advance and knew they would all meet at. And then after the destruction was complete, the Roman armies left, they came back. Okay. But it was Simon, this youngest one. He, I think Simon is also identified as one of the two, and I don't remember the other one, disciples that were on the road to Emmaus. So I'm just filling that all in. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to accept it. But there are relatively strong sources that attest to that. Okay, so I just bring that up now because we just read about these mother and brothers arriving early on in the ministry of Jesus and they weren't exactly on board yet. Mary, I'm sure, was. but They came to get him. He's out of his mind. Or maybe just because they felt like if you are the Messiah, you need to be back here working with us. We're the descendants of David, right? What are you doing dealing with these others? Okay. So that's that. So let's move on. Chapter 4 is a beautiful, we have this beautiful chapter of four parables, followed by, I hope we get to, a chapter of a couple of really, really beautiful stories in the life of Jesus that are very instructive, not only about his authority, but about his heart. Okay. The first of these four parables, the parable of the sower, which we're pretty familiar about. He's teaching them by the lakeside. He's in Tabga, probably the bay of, I mean the cove of parables. Again, he began to teach them by the lakeside, but such a huge crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the water and sat there. I've explained to you, right? If you get in a boat in the cove, the water's lower now, so the middle of the cove will be a little further away from the shore then, which had been close, but then there's the three sides of the, of, the, of the cove there that lead up 50 meters or so to the top, and all around, you know, is this grassy place, and you could, the acoustics there are just naturally great. It was a wonderful place to go out and speak to large crowds, just natural. So if you stood in a, a boat there in the middle of the cove, you know, thousands of people could gather in this very comfortable place and hear you, so he's there. And he's teaching them. The whole crowd were at the lakeside on the land, he taught them many things in parables. And in the course of his teaching, he said to them, Listen, imagine a sower going out to sow. Now what happened as he sowed, some of the seed fell on the edge of the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some seed fell on rocky ground where it found little soil, and at once sprang up. But because there was no depth of earth, when the sun came up, it was scorched. And not having any roots, it withered away. Some seed fell into thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it produced no crop. And some seeds fell into rich soil, grew tall and strong, and produced a good crop. The yield was 30, 60, or even 100 fold. 20 was good. 20 was good. And he said, anyone who has ears for listening should listen. 
since Jesus is going to interpret this in a minute, we'll go on. <laughs> this is, by the way, did I tell you last week about a Markin sandwich? The right literary term is a chiasm. And Mark uses it, and he's going to do one here, where he's telling a story, and he like interrupts the story he started to tell you another story, and then he finishes his first story. So there's a bonus story sandwiched in between. Right, so he, he has this parable, and he's going to go on to the next parable, speaking to the same group. But in between, it says, he was alone with the twelve, together with the others who formed his company, and they asked what the parables meant. And he told them, to you is granted the, what word do you have right there? Secret. Does it, everybody has secret? Yeah. Mystery. mystery, thank you. To you is granted the mystery or the secrets of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, everything comes in parables. And he quotes Isaiah. So that they may look and look, but never perceive. Listen and listen, but never understand. To avoid changing their ways and being healed. Before he goes on to explain the parable, we should discuss that. Because to our modern sensibility, in a way that's worded, it almost says like, I speak to them in parables to be tricky enough so they won't really get it. Do you think that's what Jesus is actually doing? <laughs> no. Trying to make them think. That's right. The secrets, the mysteries. Ra's or rays is the right word. And it's, it's divine. It's, it's speaking of divine providence and its workings in reference to man's salvation. All right. So I speak to them about these mysteries, these supernatural realities in their language, in ways they can at least get a glimpse of. Maybe not going to understand fully. But all around them at that time, they're, they're planting, right? These people are agri agricultural, they know, or they're very, at least very familiar with it. He's speaking them into the language of the place and the time and their culture, something they understand very well. And he's speaking to them because they are dull because of sin. Those that are not inclined to believe, those who are not of good will or good heart, who are open to faith, are not going to get it. Those who are will be drawn to it. And he's putting it out in a language so that the decision is theirs. They're not ready for the explicit explanation that he says, you apostles, I'll give you right now. Or you've made a sort of the step of faith. Faith not maybe the way we normally think of it, but faith in the sense of uh, a definition I find very useful. Faith is a gift from God giving us the ability to understand or accept things that are beyond our rationality. Okay? Yes, it is to believe things, but it is also, we have our natural senses that give us a way to detect and to know what's in our natural surroundings. But there are supernatural realities around us too that our sight and our, our touch, our taste, cannot perceive, right? So therefore, rather than just being totally lost, God gives us the gift of faith. Even before that gift is uh, too pronounced, I think all human beings have on board, until we manage to just totally destroy it, an ability to perceive that there's, such a, there's something more than just the natural realities all around me. There is something more. There is some reason to it all. It's not just all, you know, random causality, right? Because all, all religions, all cultures have had religion. All cultures have had some attempt to explain this sense of supernatural otherness that's out there and all around us, right? So we have that on board. But God gives us the gift of faith, a gift of the Holy Spirit, that if we receive it, then we really can begin to detect things of a spiritual nature and even begin to, begin to understand them. Maybe not in a way that satisfies our logical, rational mind, because these are super logical supernatural truths, but in a way that we can accept them nonetheless. You get it? Yes. All right, so to those who have faith, and he's realizing these followers have opened themselves up to that. So to those that can receive it, he'll now explain it. He said to them, do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand any of the parables? I guess this is one of the simpler of them. If you don't get this, ay, ay, ay. What the sower is sowing is the word, the word of God. Those on the edge of the path where the word is sown are people who have no sooner heard it than Satan at once comes 
and carries away the word that was sown in them. Similarly, those who are sown on patches of rock are people who, when first they hear the word, welcome it at once with joy. But they have no root deep down. They do not last. Should some trial come or some persecution on account of the word, at once they fall away. Then there are others who are sown in thorns. These have the word, but the worries of the world, the lure of riches, and all the other passions come in to choke the word, and so it produces nothing. And there are those who have been sown in rich soil. They hear the word and accept it and yield a harvest, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Verse 16. No, no, I'm sorry. 17. Then when tribulation and persecution comes because of the word. Could you flesh that out a little bit? Well, that could mean explicitly perse persecuting you because you're a Christian. And maybe people around you don't like it. But it could also be... If the enemy is afraid of you now, if you're expressing faith in the person, the way that can deliver you forever from his clutches, I think that persecution, the trials, the tribulations can also come from that. Have you ever noticed that when you make a step towards God, all hell breaks loose? So uh, you all are experienced enough in the life of the Spirit to understand that, yes, and almost you can expect it. If he says, yes, Lord, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to get rid of this bad thing. I'm going to do this good thing. I'm going to step out of my comfort zone. I'm going to do something for someone else. And it's purely of God. You can fully expect opposition to come up in one form of another. Okay? So if our commitment is not deep enough, or if we have not bathed it in enough prayer or support, or any of the ways that wisdom would tell us to deepen our roots, to, you know, to withstand what's coming, then we may not last. It may be plucked right out of us. I think both of those interpretations are valid. And maybe others. Because I think what he's saying here is a parable not only for how the church has grown in the world by the good word of God, which is always good seed, being sown, and how it's sometimes accepted, sometimes accepted for a while, sometimes productive. But I think he's also talking about the soil of our own hearts, right? And trying to have, be fertile soil. To accept, receive, protect, nurture the word of God which has been planted in us. Not to, I think the biggest threat to authentic Christianity is complacency. To thinking, okay, I've got it, that's good. I'm done. Because it'll, it'll, it'll atrophy or it'll be attacked. And if we have not nurtured it, made it strong, put down those roots... Yes, we can wither. In the book of Revelation, when Jesus appears to John and he's criticizing certain churches, he, he, says to, he says to more than one, you've lost that first love. You were once on fire. You've become complacent. Lukewarm, he says it. I wish you were hot or cold because your lukewarm is kind of disgusting and I'll spit you out of my mouth. Pretty graphic. It, unpleasant. But, it, but, it, but, the, but the teaching is real and it's, and it's strong. And it's, and it's, in, in all of Paul's letters, when he's writing back to the churches he's established, he's not really worried about them going back to working, uh, worshiping pagan gods. He's worried about them becoming complacent, becoming worldly, becoming less spiritual, and drifting away. Now, I think the spirit of complacency is the biggest challenge of the church in general and of our society of the Christian mindset today. I just think that we've been taught that too many compromises are okay. We underestimate them. But of course, too many compromises have, has us living at the edge. At the edge. Where it doesn't take too much to tip us off. Now, I've told you the old story about the man who heard a, a thump in his little boy's bedroom and he ran in, a little boy sitting on the floor. And he said, son, what happened? He said, I guess I fell asleep too close to where I got in. <laughs> There's a lot of wisdom in that. Yes, there is. 
All right? So that's why I think is one of the dangers of the theology. It's usually called saved, once saved, always saved, or saved and satisfied. I just think it, it, it's got built into it a temptation to complacency, which is, which is a, a toxin for the spiritual life. Okay, you can, you can pick one of these situations right here. The word may be true. The response may be true. Joyful, enthusiastic, authentic. But without the wisdom to know that now I need to bathe it in prayer and worship and joining a community and getting in the word and all the rest of it to make my strong against the attacks that will come. The weeds that are grow here, or the birds that can come down and try to steal it. If I don't do that, I could lose it. Nothing wrong with the word still. But the, maybe the soil's not that fertile anymore. Any other interpretation or comment on that? Like, All right. Well, we've, we've just dealt with the baloney. Now let's go back to the other piece of bread. He's going to go back to finish more, another parable. He also said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a tub or under a bed? Surely to be put on a lampstand, for there is nothing hidden, but it must be disclosed. Nothing kept secret except to be brought to light. Anyone who has ears for listening should listen. Give me an interpretation of that one, just quickly. Your heart's open to hear. Heart be open to hear. Your heart's truly open to hear. Not to hear what you want to hear. Because that's a narrow hole that, you know, it may not be intended for. Here's the open to hear what is said. But what is said right here in this one? None of these are going to totally encapsulate the, the mysteries of the kingdom. But this is, you know, these are aspects, characteristics of it. So one is, that, one is all right. So I think something that we can see through both of these parables. Remember I told you the old covenant was all about quarantine and protection. Don't be contaminated by the outside world. So in other words, if you've been given something precious, which is the word of God, as is explained in the Old Covenant, take that golden treasure, put it in a lockbox, protect it, tuck it away where nobody can get at it. That's the old wine. And the old wine skins of the way to practice religion in the Old Covenant were okay for it because it was all about ways to protect, segregate, quarantine yourselves. Jesus said, that's not, that's not what we're up to now. These, he said, the seed, what do you do with it? You invest it. Put it in the soil. Let it do what it wants to do. Think of the parable about the leaven. Is that one in here? Uh, no, he uses a mustard seed here. But in another place, the leaven. The leaven, that little bit of leaven compared to the dough is a very small, comparatively small and insignificant part. But he says, when it's invested and need it all through it, it changes the whole thing, right? The mustard seed is going to be a very similar uh, 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 lesson. The light, too. If you've been given a light, don't hide it. The light's not just for you or your group or people like you. It's to bring light into the darkness and the gloom that's out there in the world. You are the light of the world. The light that Jesus brought is now in us. I want you to go out and light the place up. Put it on a mountain. Put it on a lampstand. Put it out there where it chases away the darkness where you're at. If we have ears to hear, we should hear, Jesus is saying. This is an aspect of the kingdom of God. It's an aspect, yes, it can speak to individual Christians, but it also speaks to us corporately. And corporately, all Christians are the church, which I, I've already put forward to you. I believe that is the kingdom of God on earth. Okay, let's move on. Here's this one. He also said to them, take notice of what you're hearing. The standard you use will be used for you. And you will receive more besides. Anyone who has will be given more. Anyone who has not will be deprived even of what he has. We all immediately just saw injustice. Didn't you? Did you sense it? Wait a minute. He's already got more, but you're going to give him more? He's got very little. He's going to take that away. How is that right? He's not talking about things. Huh? He's not talking about things. He's not talking about material things. So what is he talking about? He's talking about faith. Sharing 
Later on in Mark, and also, I told you, this, the, all these stories, almost in this exact order, are also found in Luke and in, and in Matthew. All right? So we can inform ourselves a little bit more of all of these parables by looking at them. And Matthew, he's specific, I mean, in Luke, he specific, specifically says he's talking about mercy. Yeah, that could be. The Hased of God. Now, doesn't that make sense? Because we, we know, and later on in Mark, he'll say, be merciful if you want to receive mercy. To the degree that you are merciful to others, you can expect God to be merciful to you. The good news is that even more, even more, be merciful a little, and you will receive mercy a lot. But if that capacity for mercy, that limited capacity for mercy for you is not used, even that will be taken away. Use it or lose it. It's atrophy, right? It's the poverty of disuse. You've been given a gift to set people free and to enrich and enliven your own soul and to put yourself in the graces of the mercy of God. If you don't use it, it's bad. Okay? Sure makes you think. <laughs> should make you think. Should make you think. He doesn't say those who have brains should use them, but that doesn't mean he's kind of saying that, right? If you have ears to hear and eyes to see, do it. Were you about to say something and I cut you off? Yes, I think sometimes when I read this passage, I think about... Thank you. Do I have some more? No, it's already on. Sometimes I think about if we have that faith, and it's very powerful in us, but there's a, something that holds us back from sharing it. I think about sometimes people say, yes, I believe this, but my job requires me to act in this regard. How does this apply to something like that? It doesn't well, you know, I understand the need to respect others' opinions. Yes. And I understand tolerance is, is a virtue to an extent. But when we get to the point that religion is my personal opinion and it doesn't need to be shared with anyone else, that's not compatible with the New Covenant wine, the way we've been seeing Jesus explain it, is it? No. It is meant not just for you, but that you, so that you can be a change, agent, a change agent in the world to accomplish what God has, has come to do in the world, that we're a member of His church. And yes, it does take some wisdom. It also takes some courage, because we're not supposed to use reticence as an, well, wise reticence as an excuse to not step out. We're also supposed to have the courage and the wisdom to know that when an opportunity is there, yes, of course, we're supposed to let our light shine and to share the gospel. Our mandate is to go out, to, to do for others, to be the offensive, I don't mean to be offensive, but to be the, on the offense, not just on the defense in the world, okay? Kindness. Kindness, well. Kindness gentleness, and, gentle, and genuine respect should also always envelop our engagement with others when we want to speak about the things of the Lord. Always. If that's not there, St. Peter says in his gospel, we, sh we should just keep our mouth shut. All right? But, but if we can do it with respect and kindness and even maybe good humor and in a joyful way, it will be attractive. Okay? You can always say, God bless Right. You can't do anything else. You can say God bless. And let's don't ever assume that other people have nothing to say right. that's not worth hearing. Because right. often they do. Okay. One again, one again. Yes. I think that the question you asked is a good question. It's already on. Okay. It's like people who hold public office and they have these religious beliefs, but because of the office they hold, the they are Outward behavior is contrary to what they believe in. Right. So, how do they Well, that's a raging conflict right now. As you know, uh, Joe Biden was refused communion by a pastor in South Carolina where he went to Mass, was it last weekend? Not too long ago. He's a Catholic, a practicing Catholic. He's also pro, well, he's, he's pro choice. Some people would say, if you're a Catholic, you can't be pro-choice. That if you are in a position of authority to make decisions in the public square, 
your decision should be influenced on what you believe is right and wrong. Well, he says, I personally think it's a wrong. But he says, I also believe a greater wrong is for me to impose my personal opinion on others. So raging controversy, and you can find bishops and theologians that come down on different sides of this. But it would take tremendous courage uh, if you were in a political camp that officially was pro-choice and you were trying to be an authentic Christian. But the best you can do, and the Kennedys did the same thing. Personally, I'm opposed. But I believe that's a decision everybody should make for themselves. The problem for that that argument, by the way, was made also in the days that they were debating the abolition of slavery. Yes, because there's, 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 there's a, a, a vulnerable party involved here that doesn't have a say, <laughs> right? Because we're not talking about how you cut your hair. We're not talking about if you should have collagen injections in your lips. I mean, there would be people who have different opinions on these things. Right? But this is, a, this is a high stakes question. And there were plenty of people saying, look, if you don't want to own slaves, don't own slaves. But don't pass a law that takes away my ability. I have no problem with it, and I need them for a lot of practical reasons that are important. Not only for me, but for the economy and the rest of it. Well, we fought a war over that. Right? Um, there are people who said the same thing about the Jews in the days of the Nazis. And say, well, how can you do this to people? And say, well, they're, hum they're humans, but they're not persons. They don't measure up to the amount of dignity it takes to be protected by the law, which is exactly the same argument pro choices would make now. We would say, well, how can you do this to an unborn human being? They say, well, they're human beings, but until they're born, they don't deserve protection under the law because they don't yet have status of personhood. And it used to be, at least, their well, argument. When do they achieve that status? But now it's to the point that up to the moment before they're born, it's still robbed from them for, for in extreme situations. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a problem, yes. Yes. <clears throat> As we're explaining this, uh, this conflict, uh, I remember one well-known person called Steve Bannon. Doesn't work. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Steve Bannon is supposed to be a Catholic. How I many is Catholic? He's Catholic. Supposed to be, you know, I'm not sure he is or not. <laughs> uh, but uh, he went and bought an old seminary, a close seminary in Rome, to go and influence the Vatican on his own beliefs. Uh, this may not be just personal. I do believe that he's a racist. And he was very close to one of the cardinals, um, a US cardinal who was working in Rome. I, I can't remember his name now. Yeah. Uh, but the point is, just as we are talking about conflicts, um, some of these individuals who have conflict about what other people do are conflicted themselves in what they do. And that is where we have a challenge. As, yes. Uh, where, where is the divide? I mean, why would he claim he wants to change Rome? Because he claims he's a Catholic. And in America here, he espouses racism and well, racial supremacy. Let, let's don't base the whole question on one man like that. I don't, I don't know him. He seems to be a pretty loose cannon, I guess. And, um, <laughs> And I doubt if he had, he had very much success influence, influence in uh, Rome at this point with some of his far-right ideas, right? But yeah, so okay, it can happen on both sides of the divides. You can be a Catholic and find yourself with being drawn to certain positions that others can say, that's not compatible with authentic Catholic orthodoxy, right? Yeah, because, yeah, you could be, I don't know about Steve Bannon, but you could possibly be a racist and somehow justify that, which would be totally wrong. Right? So, I mean, let's face it. The church will have another parable in another place. Jesus says, the kingdom of God is full of wheat and weeds. That's a very useful one. We, the sower sowed good seed, but the enemy came and sowed weeds. And the two are growing together. 
And at the end of time, when they're full grown, and it's easy to tell the two apart, they will be separated. But until then, they're allowed to grow together. Now, that's obviously not a future utopian heavenly idea of kingdom of God, because that's not going to happen in heaven, right? But it certainly applies to the church here and now, and as we've known it for the last 21 centuries. There are plenty of weeds in with the wheat. The church now and has always been in need of reform. Sometimes in this direction and sometimes in that direction. Okay? That's just a reality. And Jesus' own parable says that. Jesus' own teaching says that we can expect it. So we shouldn't be disappointed if we have a, not just a layman, I'm, Steve Bannon is insignificant to me, but well, what if you had influential bishops and cardinals or even a pope doing things that really bothered you? Well, maybe they should bother us. We should pray for them. But my faith in the divinity, the holiness of the church, is not based in any of them. I believe the origin of the church is from God. It's from the Holy Spirit. And, and the, the room's going to be stunk up a little bit because there's plenty of sinful human beings in it. But at its, at its, at its ontological basic being, it's a holy organism ordained by God. And we, we can't stray from the gospel. And, and and when you're going to the right uh, wing, as they call it, you're straight. And you can't, we can't. Do that. You can stray either way. You can stray right, left, north, south, east, west, in, out, up, and down. It's very hard maintaining. Right, so, if you, so the only thing we can do is do exactly what Father Ray tells us. At all times. To stay on beam, right? And the last thing you should do is listen to me. <laughs> right. The narrow path, I mean, we know those parables too, right? The eye of the needle. The narrow path. He doesn't imply that it's easy. Sleep in. Take it. You know, I mean, it, it does, there's no, there's no way that Jesus implies that. Again, Saved and satisfied, once saved, always saved. I think it's not only wrong, I think it's dangerous. Because it just has a built-in temptation to complacency. Not all do, of course. But, yeah, and that's not... You're not going to thread that needle by being complacent on which way you shoot the arrow. Right? Or, or which, how you try to stuff your camel through there. <laughs> right? All right. Mm -hmm. All right, we have another parable here. Uh, in verse 26, the third of the four. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. So if you haven't known up to now what his parables are about, it's about aspects of the kingdom of God. A man scatters seed on the land night and day while he sleeps. When he is awake, the seed is sprouting and growing. How? He does not know. Of his own accord, the land, of its own accord, the land produces first the shoot, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear, and when the crop is ready, at once he starts to reap, because the harvest has come. So what would that imply to us about the kingdom of God? Is it dependent on God, or is it dependent on us? The land's not going to produce anything unless the, so the seed is sown. But the man who throws the seed cannot make the seed grow and turn into a harvest either. So what's the marriage here? It's both. Don't you think that's what he's trying to put across? The farmer does his part. He certainly can't take credit if there's a bountiful harvest. Right? The weather conditions, the soil, just the miracle of germination and how that little bitty seed turns into food for his family. He, has, he doesn't know how it works. Couldn't make it happen on his own accord. It does happen, but still the seed had to be sown. The soil had to be prepared. He might have to in times of drought dump a little water on it. So we help. We have our part to play. But ultimately it's the work of God, isn't it? So that should do two things. It should inspire us to do the best we can. It should protect us from any temptation against pride if we have any success. Not only in cultivating virtue in our own lives, but in anything ministry-wise we try to do for others. Right? I think it's just the basic wisdom built into that. Parable number four. He also said, what can we say 
the kingdom is like. What parable can we find for it? It's like a mustard seed, which at the time of its sowing is the smallest of all of the seeds on earth. Have you ever seen mustard seeds? They are little bitty things, aren't they? Like, like pinheads almost. Yet once it is grown, it grows into the biggest shrub of them all and puts out big branches so that the birds of the air can shelter in its shade. What's he trying to say? That's right. A little faith goes a long way. That's good. But also, the power of the Word of God. I mean, he's already said, invest that little thing you have in and it'll produce. Now he's going to the extreme. So not just any seed. You can take the littlest seed there is that we know of. And it too will produce a big, bountiful result. <clears throat> as long as you keep it. A long lot, right. It's in fertile soil. So he's talking about the power of God to build the kingdom of God, but at the same time, our place to play, our part to play. Don't you think? I think that's been all the parables. All the parables <clears throat> that he's doing here and in other places have to do with teaching us some aspect of the kingdom of God. So in these four parables, he's taught us about how powerful the word is, how necessary it is to try to be receptive and fertile to it, how important it is for us to do our part, how, how, but how ultimately we're totally dependent on the work of God to make it fruitful, but that all of these things are going to be part of what he's brought into the world. The conception, the birth of the kingdom of God, the church. Okay? The power of the gospel, the power of witness, the power of truth, the power of faith, and the necessity of faithfulness on our part for it to be what he wants it to be. It's back to us. It, it is. It doesn't begin with us. It doesn't end with us. But somewhere in there, we have our part. <clears throat> Jay, I, I, was, I was thinking that to carry this agricultural theme a little further, you know, the idea of planting something a little and grow it exponentially. The bread and wine I set this right. kind of like finite things. You know, you have a little plate of posts. Oh, bread and wine is up to so. You got a cup of wine. Okay? Yeah. But by the power of God, that becomes Jesus, who is incomprehensible. Yeah. It becomes incomprehensibly big. Yeah. Just what we can see. That's very good. I've never thought of it either. Uh, in all of the sacraments, we claim incredible, supernatural, miraculous is not too small of a word, things that happen when we perform this, the ritual that has become a sacrament. It's not logical. It's not rational. Our eyes, our tastes cannot inform us of what's going on there, right? Still looks and tastes like bread and wine. Faith can change that opinion, but it requires humility. For one thing, we have to subdue our rationality, which is telling us something totally different. And part of the invitation God has given us is not to be limited anymore in our understanding of the world around us, or reality, by our mind. But to be lifted up to a whole new place we couldn't possibly achieve on our own by understanding through faith. To know things through faith. Through faith we can know what happens at the sacrament. And the incredible change in power that's there. In the genius of God, all of the outward signs, the elements that we use in all the sacraments are very simple, but they have sign value, right? So the bread and the wine signifies food. And the grace of the Eucharist is the grace of power we need to live this week for God, to thank Him and worship and praise for what he, the graces He gave us last week, right? Likewise, we could say the waters of baptism or the oils of confirmation, all the rest. These things are simple and it also shows us, yes, we're supposed to bring, obey what we've been told. Bring those simple things. And if we invest them in faith and what God will do, he will bring back oh, forth an abundant harvest, which is the point you make. So these parables can be applied specifically to the action of the sacraments in the kingdom of God. Thank you. That's great.
I always love the spit and the dirt that he used to open the man's eyes. Use your microphone, please. Oh, shoot. I always liked the uh, reading where he talked about the spit and the dirt to open the man's eyes. Right. I see that as a sacramental. Of course. That was a... It wasn't magic spit. No, it wasn't magic spit. No. He chose to use something that really was humiliating for this man, right? He made mud. He decided to do a supernatural thing using the natural things that he had created. And he said, and they are good. And it's all good. So there are those super spiritual people, some of the original heresies in the church, and even today, people would say, I don't believe God does supernatural things through such ordinary material things. So they reject the sacraments on that basis. Even if they do some of them. <laughs> they don't call them sacraments, they'll call them ordinances. But even some that, that still have a couple of sacraments, they still don't claim what we claim happens in them because I guess they're more spiritual than Jesus because Jesus, Jesus chose to heal that man that way. He made spit, rubbed it in his eyes, and then told him, now go wash it out, not at this pool, the pool of Siloam, which is clear on the other side of town. Stumbling blind through town with mud all over your face. Receiving whatever comments are going to come your way. If you get deterred, because I'm testing your faith. I want to see now. This is what you have to do. You have to subdue your pride. Obey in humility to the things that your brain is telling you is silly. And you're going to make a choice now. Either in faith, to do what I tell you without a human understanding, or follow your emotions and your pride. Your pride's going to tell you this is not possible. Your emotions are going to say as people are making fun of you, I shouldn't do this. The choice is yours. But if you stumble all the way through town, wash yourself in that pool, you'll be healed. Then go show yourself to the priest. Then go show yourself to the priest. But don't we do that every time we ask for something? We don't get it from the kind of just move back out of where Okay, well, there's parables about that, too. She's talking about the times that we want something, we pray for it, we don't get it, and so we give up thinking, well, God let me down. But remember all the, all the parables about being persistent in prayer. You know, being persistent in prayer. We don't know what walls have to be torn down first. Maybe we have to war against what's standing between us and that blessing for a while. All right? I always tell people, some people say, I prayed for that a hundred times. I said, what if it takes 101? Don't quit, right? Don't quit. Until you have an answer. The answer may be no, but I say until the answer is obviously no, I think it's a not yet. Okay? And it may not be exactly what you want. No, of course. Can, well, that's an answer, though. He can work wonders if you ask him and, and you'll be happy with what he does. There's a country song. Yeah. Thank God for unanswered prayers. And he's singing about all the girls he dated that he was so in love with and he wanted. And now he looks at them 30 years later and he says, oh. well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God for unanswered prayers. <laughs> Thank God for unanswered prayer. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly what that means, but you made me think of it. <laughs> what we think of. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Using many parables like these, he spoke the word to them so far as they were capable of understanding. That's as far as they could go. So he's speaking them in the language of their, of their time and of their space and of their life experiences. They weren't theologians. They weren't deeply vested in you know, mystic or theological understandings. He spoke to them the language that they could understand. They gave them the best opportunity to begin to perceive supernatural realities. He would not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything to his disciples when they were by themselves, and even they had a hard time sometimes. Now we have a beautiful story of Jesus uh, 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 teaching about his authority in yet another level. We've seen him do what so far in the Gospel of John? He's healed and that's increased in magnitude, hasn't he? He's healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law that had a fever. We see him heal a leper, uh, a paralyzed man. You know, it's like increasing volume, I'm almost say. Uh, we've seen him expel demons. Some of them 
lesser, some of them bigger, right? So that too. But now we see him, he's going to exert his authority over nature. When the coming of evening that same, with the coming of evening that same day, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. They're going to leave for a day, maybe two, and come right back. So here's an extended Mark and Sandwich. Okay. He'll be back right in the same place pretty soon. But um, first of all, he said, let's go to the other side. Now, he doesn't mean they're at the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee. He doesn't mean let's go to the southern tip. They're going to go out, and they're going to go about 10 miles east. I know that because it says where they land. Let us cross over to the other side. And the next story, he's going to say they're in Gadara, where he's going to meet the Gerasene demoniac. That's where that was. Leaving the crowd behind them, they took him just as he was in the boat, and there were other boats with them. Then it began to blow a great gale, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that it was almost swamped. But he was in the stern, his head on the cushion, asleep. They woke him and said to him, Master, do you not care? We are lost. And he woke, rebuked the wind and the sea, and said, Quiet now. Be calm. And the wind dropped, just like their jaws. Yeah. <laughs> and there followed a great calm. And then he said, now, you leave me alone let me sleep? No. Then he said to them, why are you so frightened? Have you still no faith? They were overcome with awe and said to one another, who can this be? Even the wind and the sea obey him. <laughs> they answer their own question, it seems like to me. <laughs> who can this be? The wind and the sea obey him. <laughs> exactly. Now I'm going to go back to sleep. So this is a new display. He's teaching them, not only, I've said, through words, but also his deeds, right? Of who he is. Of all the things. And Jesus, he did teach morality, but he didn't really come to teach a new ethic so much. Almost all that he taught in the area of morality is in the Mosaic law. Maybe it had to be polished up a little bit. But the primary thing Jesus came to teach, and the hardest thing, He's having to get across is who he is. Who he is. Everything is going to depend on that. He's not giving them a, a new form of Phariseeism, you know, or adding or tweaking it a little bit or something like that. That's not it. He's radically changing everything based on the basis of who he is. Right? So he's trying to get across to this core group beginning, please, God, they're hard enough, and eventually to others, who he is. And I can imagine the conversation they had on the last hour or two of this trip. Jesus goes back to sleep and say, did you see that? Yeah. Joe, did you see that? <laughs> Am I dreaming? Did I just see him walk up and tell the storm to be quiet? And they said, yes, sir. <laughs> that would blow your mind. That blow, blow my ever-loving mind, as we say here in the South, right? <laughs> you can almost hear him thinking. So now, who do you say? All right, all right. I think my response is, nobody talk. I've got to sit down and think about this for a minute. I've got to sh shut up and think about what I just saw. I've got to process something I wasn't ready for, right? I'm sure some of them couldn't say anything. No, they said they were awestruck. That usually implies, oh, you know, there's not a lot of speaking, right? Okay. So then they land 10 miles or so to the east. Took them a while to get there because the, the weather was not conducive, but they get there. When you, when you land on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, there's a, there's a large plateau. It looks like a wall. And it starts up in Syria and it goes all the way to Africa. But it runs the length of Israel. And that's the Golan Heights. Okay? That, that's what's gone back and forth between wars with Syria. Okay? Because before there were jet fighters and satellite in the sky, whoever had the heights had a real advantage being able to see into the territory on the other side. And uh, the Israelis took that in the Six-Day War from Syria, and they still occupy it now. Tourists are not really able to go there much now because it's too close to Syria and all the trouble that's going on there. But if you go up there, you can see what's left over of uh, anti-aircraft emplacements and things like that that are still here and there. On the other side of it is land that really wasn't considered part of Israel proper. It was pagan territory. Jews lived there some, but they were a minority. It was also though, still part of the kingdom of Herod. So that's where they go. And as far as the record from Mark goes, this is the first time he really goes to 
what we might call Gentile territory. They reached the territory of the Gerasenes, the Decapolis, which means ten cities, on the other side of the lake. And when he disembarked, a man with an unclean spirit at once came out from the tombs toward him. The man lived in the tombs and no one could secure him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been secured with fetters and chains, but had snapped the chains and broken the fetters. Got superhuman strength. No one had the strength to control him. All night and all day among the tombs and in the mountains he would howl and gash himself with stones. What a hideous sight. Catching sight of Jesus from a distance, he ran up and fell at his feet and shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? In God's name, do not torture me. Is this the man speaking? No. We've seen this before. It's the unclean spirit that's in him. For Jesus had been saying to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, this is creepy. What is your name? He answers, my name is Legion. Well, there are many of us. Yup. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the district. This is pagan district. And by the way, the pagans in this area we know used to offer sacrifices to pagan gods that the Jews considered demons. And what did they sacrifice, do you know? Babies. What animals? Well, what animals did they sacrifice? Pigs. pigs. That's why they're raising pigs here. You know they're not in Israel, they're raising pigs. And they didn't eat bacon in Israel, right? So they're raising pigs here. They not only ate them, but they sacrificed them, which would have been a, a, a sacrilege to Jewish. And they sacrificed them to pagan gods and demons. And he begged them earnestly not to send them out of the district that they liked and were comfortable in. Now on the mountainside there was a great herd of pigs feeding. And the unclean spirits begged him, send us to the pigs. Let us go into them. So he gave them leave. And with that, the unclean spirits came out and went into the pigs. And the herd of about 2,000 pigs charged down the cliff and into the lake. And they were all drowned. The men looking after them, the swine herd, ran off and told their story in the city and in the country round about, and the people came to see what had really happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, and the man who had had the legion in him, properly dressed and in his full senses, and they were afraid. Remember, these are people who have been going out from time to time, who drew the unlucky straw, had to go out and try to subdue him again and try to chain him up again, and... You know, what a job. And those who had witnessed it reported what had happened to the demoniac and what had become of the pigs. And they began to implore Jesus to leave their neighborhood. It scared them. It scared them. And as he's getting into the boat, now he didn't stop and evangelize these people. Yet, timing, the wisdom of timing is everything. But he doesn't leave them without a chance to be prepared for the next time he comes. As he's getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed begged to be allowed to stay with him. Jesus would not let him, but said to him, Go home to your people and tell them all that the Lord in his mercy has done for you. Put your lamp on a lampstand. Take the seed of faith in your experience and invest it in the soil of the people that know you, that can't doubt your story. They know your saga. They know your life. They know what you've been through. So what about your mother, your family? What agony they must have been in all these years, knowing how you were living out here, what was going on for you, and them totally powerless to help you. Go back and tell them what the mercy of God did for you. Do you think that that preached? I think the response would be, how do we know more about the mercy of God? Jesus is going to return to this territory. This is going to be exactly the place that the feeding of the 7,000, the second feeding of the multitude, takes place. And this time it says, when he gets there, they come out of everywhere to come and hear him talk about the goodness of God. Why? Because he left this new apostle here. This new disciple. Who knew nothing about 
the Jewish prophet named Jesus came, spoke, just spoke to the 2,000 demons that were in me, making my life literally a hell on earth, and they left. And I'm whole. And he said it's because of the mercy of God. That's all I know. Boom. Right? Sometimes there's just no other word. Who's the guy that throws the spice in there? Emerald. Emerald, right? Boom. All right? Right. Bam. Bam, right. And everyone was amazed. So I hope we're amazed, because that's where we're going to end right now. Pick up with the beautiful story of the woman with the hemorrhage next week. Before he goes, yeah. Oh, he's going to come back and finish the Mark and Sandwich. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, begging for your mercy healing power of your mercy on our minds, our hearts, and our spirits to deliver us from all that is ungodly on us and in us. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.